Namaste and good evening to all of you. My name is uh, Shiv Kumar. I am part of the Indica fraternity and uh, I write, uh, uh, you know, mainly on the uh, Itihasa Purana tradition of India. We are very happy and thankful to the Khaki Tours for providing us this opportunity to present our book, Arya, an anthology of Vedic women, 10 women, 10 stories and 10 authors. It's curated by me and I'm very happy that uh, uh, my colleague uh, Manjula ji is there in this talk. As you can see, it's an anthology and uh, it's, it's a curation. Uh, the, I'll give a small, brief, uh, you know, um, glimpse into how we came to uh, shape this. For long, it was um, in my mind that if you look at any of our um, ancient texts and until till modern times, 1800s, in every century, you will get a significant number of women who have contributed to the civilization. So in, a, in, in many ways, Bharata Varsha, is a civilization shaped by women as well. And uh, we thought that uh, there is a scope to, uh, you know, present this in an integrated manner. Harikiran um, Vadlamani, who is the head of Indic Academy, uh, he had called for anthologies, uh, you know, for uh, curators who can curate anthologies based on specific concepts. And this is a concept that uh, I presented which uh, Shri Harikaran accepted. Another thing that used to bother me, uh, uh, not bother, but you know, perplex me, uh, is that a lot of women who in the ancient texts are actually very strong, um, have come to be known as uh, subdued and docile in the uh, modern world. Uh, Savitri, for example, is actually a very strong lady and courageous lady in the tradition. But somehow the metaphor of Savitri in the modern world is exactly the opposite. So we thought that there is an opportunity for us to present uh, accounts truthful to the texts where they originate from. And that is how uh, the anthology was started. Of course, we have started in the most ancient Vedic times, but we will we hope to come uh, all the way till 1800 and cover all uh, uh, you know, glorious women who have shaped the civilization. The book Arya consists of 10 stories and you know here we present all the 10 stories Chitrangada, Damayanti, Shakuntala, Subhadra, Madhavi, Satyavati, Ulupi, Gargi, Maitreyi and Shandilya Duhita. I've also presented the names of uh, all the authors Rohini Gupta, Manjula Tekal, Prasad Kulkarni, Bharati, Madhurima, Deepak MR, Rajini Muralidhar, Salia Pillai, and Kavita Krishnamigama. So over the last two years, we have uh, toiled and you know uh, and ensured that all our individual stories are well composed into a single book that reads both as a single book as well as a collection of short stories with multiple voices. So it has to, it, it in many ways it represents uh, our country, unity in diversity as well as diversity in unity. A small brief on uh, the word Arya itself, you know, why we chose. Firstly, the word starts from the Vedas itself. In the word, in the Vedas, the word Arya is refers to a specific set of uh, kingly dynasties, you know, which, which were considered as, uh, you know, uh, noble and of high culture and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so on. And then, uh, and, and, and uh, from then on, it, the word spread across the country to represent uh, noble culture. So, in, firstly, it has a, uh, a positive cultural connotation. At the same time, it is starts from the most uh, ancient times, and the word has continuously evolved and you know brought itself down to every single Indian language. For instance, the word Aya in Canada, my mother tongue. It it is it comes from Arya, you know. In 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 the word uh, in the Canada, it represents uh, nobility and gentleness and uh, you know good culture. And you can find that in every single language, either in the original Prakrit or in the Dravidian languages, you'll always find an equivalent of this word. Thus, we thought this truly represents the 
uh, civilization and all women of high culture who have contributed to the civilization. Secondly, the book Arya, the first uh, uh, version that we are presenting, it's about women from the Vedic culture. And uh, the, it is what we have presented is a perspective of the heritage, perspective of the tradition as it appears in the original accounts. So, uh, you know, while there is a lot of creative reimagination, uh, because we are presenting uh, each of these stories as a, a short story of the modern form, uh, you know, uh, from 20, 20 to 25 pages, but it consists of elements that are actually uh, presented in the, either in the original Mahabharata or, you know, one of those later texts. Nothing in the story contradicts the original. At the same time, it expands. So it connects a lot of dots. Interesting thing about these stories is that in Mahabharata or any other text, all of these aspects about a single character do not come in the same place. You know, you can imagine Mahabharata is a, a book of one lakh shlokas and often you know, some aspect comes in the first parva, some aspect comes in the third parva, and then something comes in the later parvas. So only if somebody has uh, read through all the uh, aspects, will be able to recreate a, an integrated version. And that is what our authors have uh, done in a very beautiful manner. And the way we have presented these is that it that civilizational narratives for us in the sense that we've picked a point in time in their life where their presence makes a significant contribution to the civilization or to something extraordinary in those times. So uh, the picking of the point of time from their lives, I think that is part of the creative reimagination. For instance, very few of us know that Subhadra, Sri Krishna's sister married to Arjuna, was among the few, few who, 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 who is back in Astinapura, you know, when the Pandavas leave. And she anchors the life of Parikshit, who becomes the king. So Subhadra plays a very important role in Mahabharata. So what must have been that role? What is the information that exists in Mahabharata? Based on that, we recreate. Similarly, in everybody's life, whatever is the whatever the original accounts say. You know, we have expanded it based on what is possible from within that text. So that is a book, Arya, in front of you. What is it that we are going to do next is we propose to really, uh, uh, you know, present the uh, short accounts and stories of all such women, uh, you know, all the way till 1800. That's a large project. It will take years to do. It will take many more like us to come onto the platform and, uh, you know, uh, do this uh, work. In the process, we hope to create a new relook at the narratives that have been formed in the last 200 years for various reasons without, you know, being sufficiently faithful to the original accounts. So we hope to shape new thought and we hope to create new cultural conversations in this process. So a small brief about each of these uh, characters. Some of them you very well know. For instance, you know, Chitrangada, Namayanti, Shakuntala, Subhadra, Satyavati, Ulupi are quite well known. However, Shandile Duhita and Madhavi are not that well known. Madhavi to some, they may have known if they have read certain parts of uh, literature. Gargain, Maitreyi also, you know, are uh, somewhat well known. But what is not well known is the extent of information that exists about each of these in the uh, texts like Mahabharata, it is dispersed across multiple uh, chapters you know, and we have brought them together. Chitrangada, you know, we just know that, you know, she is, uh, 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 she, she gets married to Arjuna and then her son Babruana. But her own personality has an account, you know, she's a warrior and she sort of seeks to uh, you know, protect her father's kingdom and that dimension is not that well known. In fact, Ravindranath Tagore has written a very beautiful poem on uh, Chitrangada and I think in modern times it's lost. 
in the story of damayanti often nala becomes the hero while it's truly damayanti who is the hero of the story and it is damayanti who uh, you know who who has uh, rejected the devatas and then chosen uh, uh, nala and when nala is in tough times it is her intelligence that brings nala back to his glory and then his uh, kingdom while the uh, you know it's one of the greatest love stories in the tradition that much is well known but looking at the at it from the you know standpoint of damayanti you no know, one will realize how much of wisdom grace and you know statesmanly nature that uh, damayanti had shakuntala of kalidasa is what we well, very well know you know but a, a little gentle uh you know who who becomes a victim of circumstances but the shakuntala of mahabharata is extremely fierce glorious and you know very courageous and takes on dushyanta questions him in the sabha itself and brings up a uh, you know young boy in a very uh, uh, all alone in a very uh, in, 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 with, with great wisdom and shapes him as a king who becomes the chakravarti and you know it's to uh, him that the you know spread of the vedic culture is uh, credited subhadra already spoke about what is the uh, enormity of her contribution madhavi the daughter of jayati goes through a very phenomenal uh, divine uh, journey and finally takes even more courageous decisions and it's because of her that jayati her father who falls from the heavens goes back to the heavens satyavati all of us know she virtually rules the kingdom of uh, hastinapura when shantanu dies for so many years and takes uh, so many important decisions and navigates through all challenges when even bhishma was shy of uh, so many things so you will see satyavati as a strong lady who 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 really anchors the ship of her kingdom in difficult times and you will see ulupi who graciously stands by the side but shapes the center gargi and maitre great philosophers you know uh, one who anchors the philosophy of uh, yagna velkya from from you know from on the surface whereas maitre anchors his philosophical journey in 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 a you know in a quiet manner so these aspects are uh, known but not sufficiently shandili dwita as a character is absolutely not known because in mahabharata she comes and goes in three four pages but what she does she does something extraordinary her tapasya takes even her husband you know back to uh, heavens and even this name is you know uh, very innovatively chosen because in in the mahabharata the name is you know comes as a little different like this chandigarh is an example where as you know many many women come in mahabharata just like that and go and if you carefully observe those three four pages you will uh, realize uh, something extraordinary happening one may question whether this this is history but this is the way women are you know presented in our ancient texts which means in the thought of the civilization this is the kind of women who were considered glorious and as you can see you know this thought when it flows into subsequent uh, you know historical era starting from first millennium onwards you will see extraordinary women who have done extraordinary uh, feats for which there is material evidence and when we come to those eras we will uh, you know we will will explore them but what is important now is to you know acknowledge that our ancients thought of women like this and you know this is and uh, that was possible because women were like this and that is how they shaped the civilization so fundamentally what we present is you know arya who has many faces with many roles they all carved a niche for themselves charted their own path they upheld dharma and they embodied the tradition so here we present the glorious women of bharatavarsha the tradition the way it presents is that the manifestation of the eternally present shakti thank you very much with this i hand over the presentation to manjula who is carved a beautiful damayanti thank you shivkumar and uh, thank you amrita for introducing me and uh, thank you everybody who is attending this presentation
Um, I'm going to switch to a presentation now. Can you see it now? Uh, let me see. Not yet. Okay. Can you see? It's not appeared yet to me. Okay. Let me just go back and share the screen. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it now. Um, thanks again to Shivkumar ji and uh, thanks to Amrita ji. And uh, okay. So here at I am a, here I'm at a point where I have to introduce all the uh, 10 glorious women all over again. And I probably will do it in a slightly different lens. You know, I cannot uh, best Shivkumar ji. So I'll have to take a different approach at this point. So basically, I uh, see Arya as a, like Shikumar ji said, a manifestation of Shaktitva, of feminine power. And it is a celebration of women as Shakti. And Shakti is the motive force uh, behind any endeavor, whether it is individual, or it is civilizational. So all these women have powered their own lives and then they have powered the civilization in some sense. And I'm going to present Arya in terms of feminism and conflict because feminism is a very, uh, very dynamite of a uh, concept right now. So it's kind of interesting to go through that. So let's go through the next one. Am I presenting it now? Okay, it's not in a presentation mode yet. Yeah. yeah now it's so who am I talking to right now? So I'm talking to an audience who are avidly curious about our civilization and traditions. And uh, most most of you have probably heard of this uh, you know concept that a man, a person or a child is eternally looking for uh, you know examining their fathers and looking at their fathers and you know, seeking to know more about their fathers and so on. So they have to, the young minds must be anchored to the wealth of our traditions because they're seeking to be, you know, plugged into our tradition. And there's a wealth of information out there, a wealth of our own culture and, you know, the ways in which we can be anchored to our uh, tradition. So this is an effort to all those youngsters who are curious about our civilization presented in a story format so that they can enjoy the stories as much as it's not an educational kind of a thing. It's only subtly educational, perhaps. It's more a story than it is. Uh, so you're going to enjoy reading that. Um, like I said earlier, it's a celebration of women and women power. And uh, like Shikumarji has already told you, it's an extraordinary, it's a story of extraordinary women since Vedic times and their relevance in contemporary times. Uh, so whenever you will, you will see when you actually read all these stories, huh? it's not as if you are, uh, you know, going through some old story and that doesn't have any relevance to modern times. All of these stories have they actually speak to you because they're very contemporary, potentially contemporary. You can actually read them and feel like, you know, you have gone through similar problems and they probably are going to be some kind of a guided light on how to handle these problems and so on. So uh, they are extremely relevant to uh, our present times. And of course, it's a celebration of our cul cultural heritage. Um, so we have Shakti as a feminine power. And you can never imagine Shiva without Shakti. He is never complete without Shakti. And every story in the Arya anthology is a manifestation of Shakti. So when um, in current times, when feminism is something that is being spoken about so much, and they are trying to you know, um, examine the gender norms and everything, and what part is feminine, what part is masculine and so on. So 
I uh, actually put it to you that no man is, you know, he is not uh, without a uh, feminine power, and no woman is uh, without a masculine, masculine, uh, you know, persona of sorts. So all these are they all these are women who have not not lost their essential femininity at all but they're very well equipped to actually navigate the masculine quote unquote the masculine world without even losing any of their femininity so that is something that you might actually find extremely interesting so the way i look at modern feminism right now is that it is casting a woman in conflict with her surroundings and she's in conflict with her children. She's in conflict with her spouse, perhaps. She's con in conflict with you know, her uh, job roles and so on. Everything is shown in terms of conflict. And that is a, an extremely stressful thing. The way you know, probably Arya looks at it, I put it to you that when you read this uh, book, um, you'll probably discover that Arya is a lot more harmonious with her surroundings. She's a lot more harmonious. She's more harmonious with her surroundings and people around and her relationships with people and so on. And conflict, on the other hand, it doesn't have to be, you know, a woman does not have to be pitted against man. She doesn't have to be pitted against her work. She's doing all those things and she's doing all those things without conflict. I'm not saying conflict is not there. Conflict is always there. But the conflict doesn't have to be formalized in either masculine terms or feminine terms or in terms of some employer-employee thing or political terms or whatever. My point is that it has to be dealt with as a singular basis. In other words, a woman is in conflict in her, on her own terms. In other words, she's dealing with problems that she is actually conflicting against. It's not as if she's conflicting against her husband or whatever the case may be. So I, um, you know, I urge you to uh, look at conflict. There are internal versus external conflicts, like, you know, real problems that need to be solved in real world versus internal problems like Dargi and Maitreyi have perhaps solved, like theoretical problems, philosophical problems to be addressed, learned, solved. And then ideas versus individuals, like Shakuntala had to grapple with the idea of an empire, how to bring up her children, I mean, her child, to shape uh, him to be, uh, uh, an, I mean, you know, um, emperor, you know, uh, emperor whom the country even today remembers, you know, the, our land is named after Bharata. So, um, and like I said, I was talking about formalization versus a clarity and identification. In other words, if you have, if you look at feminism, you probably will have to look at uh, a problem in isolation that a person is trying to solve versus a formalism that you're trying to grapple with. Like, you know, like you uh, define feminism as a conflict against some you know, uh, chimerical idea of you're fighting against, uh, um, uh, you know, the uh, oppression, paternalistic oppression and so on and so forth. Anyway, so here I go through a laundry list of all the characters. Uh, again, Chitrangada, like for example, uh, Chitrangada was a putrika, like she was a daughter who had to take care of her own kingdom. And that was her challenge. And that was what she was grappling with. And she even fights Arjuna before she becomes his wife. So there is the conflict that she's dealing with. And Damianti has this idea of a perfect marriage. And there is in Mahabharata, there is a verse which says, when excellence mates with excellence, the results are extraordinary. So that is the story that is like, you know, she, she falls in love with the concept. Like she hasn't even met Nala when she actually gets married to him. She actually falls in love with him. I mean, to say she's met Nala when she marries him, but she falls in love with Nala when she has not even met him. At that point in time, he's actually a concept, you know? And then she hears that he's a extraordinary horseman. Uh, he's extraordinarily good looking and he is a king par excellence and all that stuff. And, she just falls in love with the guy. And then 
at that point in time there are four devas uh, who are uh, vying for her hand and then um, in fact nala is the one who brings the proposal to her and then she decides to choose nala over all those people and then problems hit and then um, she loses her kingdom and then um, nala becomes a gambler gambles away um, the kingdom and so on and then finally she is left alone in the forest and so on and then lots of things happen i let you read the book so that you can enjoy the rest of the story um so but at that point in time she has to examine the concept of a perfect marriage and what is it that she is looking for in a mate and what is it that she has to do you know and then she discovers that she, her connection to nala is a lot more than what she has um, you know it's it's a lot more than what she has seen so far i mean she has a lived in experience she knows that this is the guy for her and this is the guy for whom she has refused uh, the devas themselves and then she starts examining exactly why uh, it was that she actually fell in love with him and then she uh, reaffirms that faith and then goes about finding him all over again and that's one of the most beautiful love stories i have i have ever read and i hope you know when you read it you also feel that it's a very nice a love story and then uh, similarly they have you know the other uh, characters have also similar conflicts like shakuntala is a character as a mother and wife and subhadra is the one who anchors the empire you know after pandavas even go away and the she is the one who is a queen mother for parikshit and then madhavi is this is a fantastic story i let you read the story for yourself and uh, i would love to see your feedback on madhavi's story and then we have satyavati again she is the uh, queen mother who shapes the uh, you know kaurava empire and ulupi is another very interesting story she is the mother of a warrior she is the one who actually trains warriors to i mean in their art and uh, she and chitrangada are really good friends and she is arjuna's wife too and uh, gargi and maitreyi are philosophers and shandilya duhita is a woman who gets married to uh, you know a pretty late and uh, it's her you know that's it's the way she looks at uh, life he examines life and all that and again it's another story which i'm sure you're going to enjoy and uh, here we have uh, that is it that is my presentation i believe that is so far and if you guys have any questions at this point i'd like to take it thank you so much uh, jv shiva kumar ji and manjula ji um uh, sure we do have some questions in the chat box and i would like to uh, read out that to you uh, so yashpal mehta says women were placed on a pedestal in early times but why are they considered as exploited when did this started yeah let me um, take this question sure i think you know if you look at till around 1800 till we okay. had the control of our own education yeah i don't think that corruption of the narrative happened mm -hmm. as late as 17750 you know uh, i think ahalebai holkar died in 1774 mm -hmm. and you know the in that era you should see the number of you know peshwa women marathi women who shaped the civilization it is all a positive account and their inspiration comes from the tradition and if you if you look at the um, accounts of that era how they look at ancient women you will clearly see that you know the high pedestal was was perceived as continued throughout the civilization and you will see that uh, you know especially you know in the marathi uh, Mara, uh, maratha peshwa accounts are available even today you know the letters and you will see a lot of women who who have uh, contributed uh, to that so once we lost the control of our own education in around 1835 i would say in post lord william bentinck era and the colonial era between 1800 to 1900 i think we lost not only lost education we also lost 
our own lenses to look at our own past. And after that, a new reality has uh, set in. So this is one uh, unfortunate thing. And that is why, you know, it is important for us to uh, regain that control over the education where we can present uh, accounts in a faithful uh, manner. Criticism can be there, but, you know, criticism should be on what exists and not what is imagined as existing. Correct. Yeah. So that is how I would put it. There are many more uh, factors to this, dimensions to this, but I'm presenting the most dominant or the most important uh, dimension to this problem. Okay, okay. I hope that answers uh, Yashpal's question. Um, our uh, next, uh, it, it's not actually a question. So Girish Nayak says, it's null, not nulla. So he says, uh, we actually tend to add a to all our historical characters, which needs to be corrected, especially <laughs> by index writers. So yeah, good, good, good point. I think the difference comes in the way the schwa deletion happens in the certain Prakrit languages and certain Dravidian languages. For instance, mm -hmm. you know, Marathi and Hindi, other Prakrit languages, mm -hmm. the, uh, the last a uh, is very gently pronounced. And in certain other languages, the last uh, is slightly uh, more pronounced. And we some of us come, so we are ten authors, and in in our own group, you know, some of us uh, slightly overemphasize it, and some of us don't emphasize it. But I okay. agree with you that we tend to stretch it a bit. In Marathi and Kannada, la yeah. is pronounced pretty strongly, actually. So uh -huh. yeah, in both Marathi and Kannada, it is lala. Acha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another question by him. He says, "Are these feminine characters all from Mahabharata?" Eight of them are from Mahabharata, and two of them are not. Uh, which are those? Maitre and Gargi are uh, from the Upanishads and elaborated further in. Sita says it would be good to have a little more depth on. Perhaps just one person to give more insight into the nature of strength and power. I know it will be in the book, but until we have the book, it would be good. So, um, yeah. We can talk about Damayanti if you like. Um, if, if that is the question that is being asked. Uh, for example. Yeah, so I think I think she's talking about if, if they could have heard more about different characters, but uh, uh, the thing is that Ed, there are uh, 10 authors uh, who have contributed to each character, and that is why um, um, Sir and Madam chose to speak about their characters, and then, you know, we can obviously have others also get talk about that. Uh, yeah, sure, we can, we can talk about that some other talk. Okay. Amrita Kali says, is there any connection regarding music with these feminine characters? I am sure there is. Actually, I am working on a different novel. I'm not talking about this right now. There is an extensive amount of music research that I want to present. It is Madalasa. And she is, uh, you know, the Ashwatara Naga. Nagas, she's uh, the daughter, actually, the uh, foster daughter of Ashwatara Naga. Ashwatara Naga happens to be a great musician. So, yes, there are characters who have uh, extensive amount of musical uh, learning that they bring. But unfortunately, in the Arya anthology, we don't have much of that. Um, the musical thing is not yet there. So perhaps in your in our next anthology, we we are going to have somebody who's an exponent of music and dance and so on. Yeah, Amrita, so, if you have time, I would like to you know speak about one more character, and of course you know you know you can invite uh, other authors and they will elaborately present. Please, please, our audience would be happy to hear about that. Yeah, sure. See, for instance, let's take uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Subhadra. Now Subhadra has gone through uh, a very, it, it's a tough time. You know, if you look at uh, it's the way it starts is that Subhadra and Arjuna, they elope and come to, uh, uh, you know, from Dwaraka and come to Hastinapura uh, to get married. So that is where uh, the story starts. And in that story, 
you know, some of you may know that in Mahabharata, there are many different recensions. You know, there are manuscripts that are found in North and South and East and so on and so forth. In the Southern part of India, where the, you know, Mahabharata is found, the Vyasa's version only, the, she is the one who drives the chariot. And, you know, she's, she's a hero of that story where, you know, they elope uh, from Dwaraka. But ever since her life is quite tough because, you know, Arjuna has to go to the forest and she has to bring up her Abhimanyu in a quite uh, all alone manner. And finally, Abhimanyu dies. And then finally, you know, uh, all that happens. And then, you know, after that, they settle down. But 36 years later, Pandavas decide to move out into uh, the uh, after uh, Shri Krishna's she has to she's survived Shri Krishna's death and Balarama's death and she is the witness to an entire decimation of uh, her uh, you know Yadava uh, clans and she's what she she arguably is the only person who survives apart from uh, you know Parikshit in that lineage and after all that tragedy finally the Pandavas decide to go to the uh, uh, go to Himalayas and she has to take care of a well-built kingdom, a restored civilization, whose past is now only represented by Parikshit and nobody else. And along with Parikshit stands Subhadra and one more king, uh, one more uh, royal person, Yuyutsu, who is Dhritarashtra's son. So the enormity of that responsibility on Satyavati, on, on Subhadra, is, is just unbelievable. And she goes through in a calm manner and we know that Parikshit you know, takes forward the civilization and it's through him that uh, the whole thing continues. So, you know, that was an inflection point in the civilization. Everything is, you know, the whole of the past, all the flows of the past comes and stands on that one moment. That is that one moment. Shri Krishna's death and Bhishma's death are two very strong moments where, you know, the difference is that in Shri Krishna, when Bhishma dies, everybody is a participant to the death. But Shri Krishna dies, there is nobody is a participant to that. And whoever is to carry forward the civilization, they are left all alone. That loneliness that Subhadra must have felt is enormous and that comes out in this story. That's one story. Shandilya Duhita is an amazing story where she's a tapasvini, you know, just like Gargi and Maitri, she's a Gargi, I would say. She's a tapasvini, <laughs> an ascetic who lives alone. And finally, when she has to go to the heavens, sage Narada comes and tells that you've not had the married experience. And, you know, both for men and women, that is one thing in the ancient texts that they have to give the runa of the grihastha ashrama. So, you know, Shandita Duhita chooses somebody and, you know, offers that, you know, I will give half my tapas here to you if you if you get married to me. And one person comes and that person falls in love with Shandita Duhita and is unable to live without uh, her when she goes away. She, her, her condition is that I'm going to stay with you only for one day. And finally, he gives up his body and along with her, her tapas here, her strength, carries forward even her husband to the heavens. So this is how, and, and, the, and the story is, you know, you know uh, her ascetic nature and all, all of that uh, comes through how she lived, how she goes, how she was questioned, how she dealt with all those questions. You know, she comes across as a very, uh, I mean, the tradition has carved and created such women where they're independent, they take their decisions, they take on challenges, they take on challenges and resolve all by themselves. Their strength gives strength to others, so on and so forth. So like that, you will see this in, in some stories, you will see this in a very explicit, strong and pronounced manner. In the story of Ulupi, you will see that same thing in calm, composed, measured manner. So that is what, uh, you know, Manjulaji was talking about as the you know, uh, Shakti, you know, the, the man different manifestation of uh, Shakti in each of these stories. Karatika Kulkarni says, would like to know more about recent strong characters like Chijama, 
too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, do you have any plans to write about? Yes, very much. We will we will come to 1700 and 1800. In the recent times, I think two extraordinary women are hmm. Rijabai and Ahalabai Holkar. Okay. And it's a pity that, you know, we don't know enough of it. Of course, you know, those who read Amara Chitra Katha, you know, we would still know. But I think we moved to a generation where I think we need uh, the stories to be told in a very different form. So we have, we definitely need to present their accounts and uh, two very glorious accounts. I mean, two accounts that we must be very, very thankful that, you know, they, they lived uh, in our civilization. Right. Girish Naik asked, are there any more books coming our way? Um, if you yeah, think, like, absolutely. We want yeah. this to be a series. I just want to add something here. Basically, uh, to add to uh, Shukumarji's point earlier, so uh, this Arya has got an emotional dimension which adds to the stories, which adds to the characters way more than on Amar Chitra Kata would. So I guess it's it's a lot more, um, you know, full-bodied in some sense. It's It's got a lot more dimension to it than uh, an Amar, Amar Chitra Kata offers. Yeah, please, sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, Ahilya Bai Horkar has been covered by Vikram Sampath in his recent book, says Girish Nayak. Correct. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with this, we end the Q&A session for today evening. So with this, we end today's talk. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much, Manjula Ji, for accepting our invitation for such a wonderful talk. Um, we had never actually explored this area, but uh, today it was really wonderful knowing about these strong women and uh, their characters. We'll surely purchase a copy of your book and read more about it. And we would like to have you again on Khaki Talk uh, whenever your new books come out. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank so, you so much. So much it's us. available on... Uh... Amazon, Flipkart, and Padega India. Sure. I would urge everybody to go and purchase their own copy. And I would like to thank the audience for joining the talk and please to keep coming this way in our future talks too. Look forward. Thank to you that. so much.